We're pleased to welcome you to the AUSA Noon Report, our virtual series featuring senior Army leaders providing important updates on key defense topics. Our host today is AUSA's Vice President for NCO and Soldier Programs and the 15th Sergeant Major of the Army, Dan Daly. Good afternoon, and welcome to the Association of United States Army's Noon Report. While we wish we could all be together here at AUSA, that just is impossible these days. So we've crafted a series of events to bring you defense leaders speaking on topics of current interest in a live interactive forum. We're very glad you've joined us today and we appreciate your support. AUSA would like to thank the Enlisted Association of the National Guard for their support for this noon report. Angus is an association member of AUSA. Our guest speaker today, is the Senior Enlisted Advisor to the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Raymond C.Z. Colon Lopez. He is the most Senior Enlisted Service Member by position in the United States Armed Forces and the Principal Military Advisor to the Chairman on all matters involving joint and combined total force integration, utilization, health of the force, and joint development of enlisted personnel. C.A.C. Colon Lopez enlisted in the United States Air Force in December of 1990. He has held assignments in U.S. Air Force Europe, Air Combat Command, Air Forces Special Operations Command, Air Education and Training Command, Pacific Air Forces, Joint Special Operations Command, and Air Forces Command Central. He has deployed numerous times in support of Operation Southern Watch, Northern Watch, Enduring Freedom, Iraqi Freedom, New Dawn, Resolute Support, Inherent Resolve, and to several other classified locations. Prior to assuming his current position, he served as the Command Senior Enlisted Leader for United States After Command. CIAC, Thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Dan. And we appreciate you taking the okay. time out to join us here on the Noon Report. For those of you that like to know more about C. Colon Lopez's many accomplishments and decorations, you can access his bio in the handout tab on the upper right-hand corner of your screen. As a reminder, if you have questions for the CEC, please use the Q&A tab on the lower right side of the screen. We'll get to as many questions as time allows, but I can assure you, if we don't have time to answer your question today, the SEAC will get to see those questions when we conclude our events. Well, SEAC, again, thanks for joining us today and giving us the opportunity and our audience out here uh, to be able to ask you some questions and really hear about the great initiatives that you're doing here um, for our Department of Defense and all across the military. Uh, thank you, thank you. And really appreciate the opportunity once again to uh, partake in this forum. Absolutely. Now, before we go out to the audience for questions, uh, there are a couple topics that I'd like to discuss that I know are important to our service members across the entire Department of Defense. Um, first and foremost, SEAC, I've heard you talk about brain health. Um, this is an important topic and something, something that needs to be discussed. You know, this month is Suicide Prevention Month, so there's no better time to discuss that than now. Can you tell us why brain health and suicide prevention are so important, and, and how can we help the force address these issues and, and get rid of the, the stigma surrounding these problems? Well, uh, then when it comes to brain health, I, I believe the chairman here recently called it uh, the final frontier when it comes to medicine. It's something that we still don't know enough about. We are making great strides on getting better programs and better mechanisms for treatment, but ultimately it's leading to a lot of personnel being taken off the line of duty. Um, also, it is affecting many others that have been medically separated or retired and I believe that we need to do more when it comes to identifying the potential pitfalls that come along with brain health and also to be able to forecast when somebody needs to take an E. Uh, for, for example, if uh, somebody's in, in a heavy artillery unit, to have biometrics in place, to be able to measure the impact that is having on the body and be able to say, hey, you know, you have had enough. It's time to take you off the line so that you can go ahead and recoup before actually putting too much tax on the body and mind. So we continue to work with the medical community on those initiatives to be able to get after the after the issue. Absolutely. Well, thank you, see, I can, mm -hmm. you know, this is a big part of your initiative, the Total Force Fitness Initiative. Yes. Can you tell us how brain health helps prevent things like suicide and will help cure some of the stigma that we have behind this illness and injury? Yeah, and I think the stigma is the hot topic out there because a lot of people shy away from going to seek help because of fear of losing their job, their clearance, uh, not being able to perform their duties or just basically being labeled as somebody that went to mental health. So as we look at the Total Force Fitness Initiative, you know, uh, the brain uh, portion of it is, uh, is a huge part of the portfolio. Um, the more we prevent, 
the instances of personal having to deal with the issues, the better off we're going to be. And something as simple as rebranding the whole way that we conduct the brain health uh, initiatives and the treatment of personnel, instead of going to the mental health clinic, maybe going to the human performance optimization clinic to where you get a head to toe check and it's non-judgmental and people feel comfortable because they know that they're going to get fixed regardless what the issue is. Uh, that is just one of the small segments that we're getting after with the Total Force Fitness Initiative. Yeah, and as you can imagine, when I was a young soldier and probably you as a young airman, and same with our Marines and Coast Guard and Navy out there, is, you know, used to kind of be labeled, to be very honestly, about going to behavioral health and where it was in the hospital, and there was a stigma behind that. But I think that making this part of a total health fitness and recognizing that this is a true injury and illness to our service members is to get the help towards the fight of getting rid of that stigma. Is that right, C.A.? No, and that is totally right. You have numerous combat deployments yourself. And uh, candidly, for those in the audience, it, it took me 15 years to finally go ahead and uh, identify that I, di I did need help. So again, it's, it's very important for our young service members and old to be able to go ahead and seek the help that they need in order for us to keep them effective. But I think that we need to get after the misconceptions of mental health. And also we need to make sure that we educate the force on what happens once you seek mental health. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I think it's mm -hmm. gonna go a long way to get us to where we need to be. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it's great to hear that the team is still working it very hard. See, I'd like, I'd like to transition to another topic that's been brought to light due to recent events across our country and even perhaps within our military, the subject of racial diversity and inclusion. And uh, with, with everything going on in the country right now, can you give me your perspective? And how does this affect military members and, and what is the department doing in response to this? Mm -hmm. Well, so one of the main things that we're doing, I, as a member of the Executive Diversity and Inclusion Board, we're looking to see what the problem is. First of all, we need to identify the problem. Now, when we look at diversity and inclusion, there's two parts of it. Number one, diversity is the inventory the people that we have in our rank and file. Second is inclusion, which is the action. Are we being inclusive enough for people, regardless of where they come from, beliefs, gender, sexual preference, to be able to have an equal opportunity, to be able to go ahead and ascend through the ranks and do what we have accomplished, to be in the top uh, percentile of the force. When you look at our demographics today and you look at the board at the Pentagon for the senior enlisted leaders, you get to see a good picture and a good future for where we stand. And you get to see a female that is now the first female that became uh, a service senior enlisted advisor. You know, we, ha we have Chief Master Sergeant Tony Whitehead out there. We got Chief uh, or Sergeant Major of the Army. I almost pulled a U there. Uh, <laughs> Sergeant Major of the Army, Tony Greenston and others to where our board is pretty diverse. And when you look at the numbers, we got to see that the enlisted force is pretty well represented, uh, representative of society. In the officer ranks, we have a little bit of work to do, but our main drive right now is just to get down to the facts, identify the problems, and be able to bring you solutions. But it's all about action, not just collecting data. What we do with the data is really what's going to define the purpose and the effectiveness of this board. That's excellent, Siak, and thanks for sharing. And we look forward to seeing the outcomes of the, the hard work that this board's going to do over mm -hmm. the next couple of years. I assume this is going to last several years. This is something that the, the chairman and the secretary want to continue on for some time. Yeah, and the department is fully invested. This, uh, this first round is going to last through December of this year, and then there's going to be a standing board after that that is going to get after it, including uh, a chief uh, diversity officer at the Pentagon. So again, this is going to be an enduring uh, endeavor to make sure that we do not get it wrong. Excellent. Well, Siak, I know that uh, leadership is important in everything that we do, and I've always said that leadership makes the difference, and I know that you feel the same way. Um, you, I've heard that you've got desired leadership outcomes or attributes, attributes. as you call them, um, for our senior leaders or our future leaders. Can you share with us what your desired leadership attributes are for, for military leaders across the force? No, absolutely, Dan. And this is something that we ended up working in concert with the service senior enlisted advisors. Again, you know, we're not, we, meaning the joint staff, is not in the business of manning, training, and equipping. The one thing that we do is we're able to take the total force and bring it together as a cohesive war fighting machine. The first thing that we need to do when we start looking at desired leader attributes is to respect the culture of each service. So we took all of the desired leader attributes from across the force 
in, uh, in collaboration and coordination with the service senior enlisted advisors. And we created a small list of uh, attributes that we're gonna be discussing here pretty soon in order to be able to better educate the force once they come in the joint environment. Uh, so a few of those that I would like to share with you, five to be exact, number one is credibility. How good of a soldier, sailor, airman, marine, coast guardsman, or space professional were you before you came into the into joint machine? And that is nothing more than your service reputation. The second one is intelligence. You know, how much do you know? How critically do you think? And how emotionally connected you are to be able to realize that services are different and that at some point you're gonna have to go ahead and tailor your method to be able to be more inclusive of the talents of others. The third one is accountability. And that goes for actions, uh, your uh, personal actions and professional actions. It also goes to your uh, resource uh, uh, responsibilities and how well you manage those things and be able to have an ethically minded driven leader that is willing to go ahead and accept responsibility and failure at times for everything that they do. Uh, the third one is adapt or the fourth one is adaptability. And that is just to be able to operate in an uncertain environment, which is very critical for all of us right now as we go into great power competition. And the last one is simply discipline. How diligent are you in executing all of those above and be able to maintain that reputation to ensure that the joint war fight is ex executed to the greatest extent possible. So again, those are just a few that I wanted to share with you. Well, thanks for sharing that with us, SEAC. And ladies and gentlemen, and our listening audience, again, if you have questions, please go to our Q&A tab and publish those questions and we'll get to as many as we can. SEAC, I'd like to shift uh, discussion topics again. I know that you're very passionate about enlisted education across the force. And many of our listeners out there, and I know across the force, are familiar with the Keystone course, which yes. is really aimed at educating the most senior enlisted folks across DOD um, from the joint perspective. But I heard there's a new initiative that, that you want to start. It's called Gateway, focused on our more junior non-commissioned officers in the ranks of E6 and E7. Can you get, tell us a little bit about Gateway and what it means? No, absolutely. And this is a project that we ended up uh, taking over two, three years ago about when we started looking at the gap in professional military education. Now, you as a sergeant uh, major of the Army had a great uh, published timeline on when the gates were ripe for soldiers to be able to be educated. So did all of the other services. One thing that I noticed on the joint educational uh, capability line was that there was a huge gap between your senior NCO education and the time that you actually got to Keystone. And some personnel actually said that it was actually late to task, that it was they had been ingrained already in the joint environment uh, and that they were maybe getting the education a little bit too late. What we did is upon assumption of responsibilities as, as the senior enlisted advisor to the chairman, we created a, a concept for E6s and E7s to be able to get some sort of joint education prior to Keystone, minimizing that decade-long gap in that education. And why E6 and E7? Because we owe it to the services for you to create the best soldier possible, all the way up to those ranks, to where they're cutting their teeth in their specialty, they know the culture of the service, and they know that they can be the best soldier that they can be. Then we can start teaching people how to be joint-minded. Joint-minded it is, because we don't want them to become, we want them to understand. They need to stay the best soldier in order for us to capitalize from those talents. Well, thanks, Siak. Mm -hmm. Siak, I've been told through the grapevine that pretty soon you have a meeting coming up with the senior list advisors from each of the services. And I know mm -hmm. you bring them together uh, routinely to discuss the important topics that affect all the enlisted force across all of DOD. Can you give us uh, some insight on some of the conversations that you're getting ready to have in your upcoming meeting with all the senior enlisted advisors? No, ab absolutely. And I think it's important for the total force to know what is it that is happening in these monthly meetings with the senior enlisted advisors. But one of the key things that I would like to highlight first is uh, when COVID first, uh, you know, ended up uh, limiting our access to uh, workplaces, mm -hmm. interaction and other things, your senior enlisted advisors were in this group cohesively working to make sure that we eliminated redundancy 
when it came to best practices. A lot of it you got to see on how we conducted recruit and basic military training across the force. Then we started learning from service across services to be able to execute other training mechanisms, i.e. special operations, uh, to be exact. And then lastly, benefits. What is it that affected the total force that we needed to go ahead and implement immediately to make sure that we alleviated the stress from the families? That is just an example of when our minds come together and what we're focused on. Some other things that we're currently working, obviously this total force initiative, uh, total force fitness initiative that I brought up is one of the main topics of discussion because every service has got equities in it. We're also dis uh, discussing the quadrennial review for military compensation, which always surfaces about making sure that uh, personnel are being properly compensated Pay is a big one, so yeah, it, pay, pay it, is a big one. It is, and we need to make sure that we're doing everything possible, especially being the, the voice of the force, to ensure that uh, that your, you and your families are properly taken care of. And uh, then, you know, obviously, diversity and inclusion has been also a main topic to make sure that when we talk across the services, that we have a common understanding of what the issue is in order for us to better tackle from a department perspective and not necessarily in service silos. Well, thanks for the update, CIA. Yeah. Thanks for letting us know the important stuff that you and the other senior list advisors are continuously working on to look at yeah. the best interest of our enlisted across the force. So, yeah, if we could, I'd like to go out to some uh, questions from our audience. It looks like they've been publishing them. And again, if you have a question, please publish it on the Q&A tab. You can also upvote questions. If you see one of the questions on there that you knew that you wanted to ask, you can click on it and upvote that question and we get those to the CIA. Siak, the first one says, uh, you mentioned it took you 15 years to seek assistance for your health concerns. Brain health is the topic. What made you decide to seek help? <laughs> well, I, I have to be very candid with you on that particular topic because my spouse, Janet, was asking me for a long, long time, they say, something is not right. You need to go ahead and take a look at that. And because of personal pride and other things, and because of the company that I kept in special operations, it was almost dirty to go ahead and seek mental health. So I didn't do it for a long, long time until the wheels really started to, uh, to come off. And uh, I was in a place to where it, it could have been a detriment to everything that we have built over the years. Finally, she just said, hey, uh, dude, you have to go in and you got to go and get help. Otherwise, you know, this is just going to get worse and worse. And that was pretty much the, the calling that I needed to answer at the time for her plea for me to get help finally. Um, I was guilty for not believing that I needed help, first of all. I was uh, worried about what will happen if I went over there. Obviously, you know, I was concerned about my reputation. What, was I gonna be seen as weak? Was I gonna be seen as broken? But the fact is that, you know, everybody's broken in one way or another, you know? We just gotta realize when that, uh, when that particular part of us is gonna affect the way that we uh, carry on every day, conducting ourselves and the tasks that we need to do. But to answer the question, that's the reason why, and I'm being just uh, you know, open and candid with you just so that everyone out there listening understands that. I, as your SEAC, because I have been there, I'm willing to advocate for every single one of you to ensure that you seek the help that you need and that we keep the force healthy and engaged and lethal. Well, see, I appreciate you sharing that. And, and you're exactly right. I mean, being open and, and honest and forthright about this, especially from a senior leader's perspective, yeah. it's what's going to give our young service members the ability to say, hey, if he or she can seek treatment, then so can I. And it's the right thing to do. Because like you said, if you're broken, it doesn't matter how. You got to go in there and ask for help if you need it. Yeah. And I mentioned this before. I was, uh, I was undergoing treatment when I was interviewing for the job at the SEAC. Yeah. So again, just listen to what we have to say and uh, seek the help that you need, all right? Don't become another number or another statistic. Just go ahead and get it right. Thank you, Siak. Another question, and continuing this important discussion on behavioral health and mental fitness, the question is, we see the discussion coming from the top, but not as much on the ground floor. Siak, how do we normalize the discussion on mental wellness and suicide within the military? So this falls back at leadership at the lowest of echelons, all right? Because that's really where the mission is happening. You know, we can provide policy, we can provide guidance, but unless key leaders, first line supervisors, most importantly, their peers, if they're not helping the situation, we're not gonna get this right. Because it takes someone to identify the person, first of all. It takes somebody else that is in close proximity to listen. And it takes their leadership to be able to properly advocate and fight for them 
to be able to make sure that they have confidence that the system is just not going to throw them away. That is where the rubber meets the road. And it's at the unit level to ensure that the peers, the leaders, and everybody else is fully invested on this initiative of breaking the stigma. Absolutely. Another question on continuing the subject, uh, because it is important, referring to brain health, have you seen service members who felt that they had a healthy control of their ill feelings, but were referred to medical experts, and then afterwards, then they started to dwell on the very ill feeling and that they had and controlling, controlling that ill feeling? Do you, have you experienced that? Yes, uh, as a matter of fact, we have. And some people were in denial, like myself. Others thought that there was something wrong, and then somebody identified it for them. And when they went in and got validated that they did, in fact, have an issue, obviously it affects you. It's almost like, like feeling healthy right now, but going to the doctor and figuring out that you have cancer. It is going to affect you. It's a natural reaction for something being wrong with us. But just like anything else, our main action is going to be to fix it. Seek every opportunity to fix it. Nobody decides to was like, all right, I got cancer. I'm just going to go ahead and sit here and die. Nobody does that. Everybody does everything. You see fighters every day going out for chemotherapy, medication, even experimental measures to be able to get better. We need to treat mental health in the same fashion because it is no different. It is an ailment. I agree. Shifting our conversation again to another very important question from Brandon Jay. What lines of efforts are being considered and executed to ensure effective retention rates across all branches of the Department of Defense? Well, I believe, as you knew, as a sergeant major of the Army, that our retention is actually pretty good. And now, even in the midst of COVID, with the lack of jobs on the outside, the military has actually seen a surplus on the accessions because young men and women want to come in and uh, join the rank and file. Uh, lines of effort when it comes to retention, I believe that we need to be more specific on what is it that you're asking about. And I will ask for you to follow on with a couple of questions if you have a specific instance that you want an answer to, because the question I said is posted right now is pretty broad, but our numbers are looking good. Are we talking about specific demographic or specific MOS, AFSC rate that we need to do better on retention, paying compensation, things of that nature? So again, I ask uh, any one of you that is asking that question to be able to give us more specific uh, uh, data on what is it that you're seeking. You know, I have a question that's based upon this, see, I can closely relate it. Uh, but not retention, but how is recruiting going across the force? I know in the Association of the United States Army, we, we stay very well connected with the Army's efforts. And actually, the Association has a member, memorandum of understanding with the Army to help them. But could you share across the, the DOD how the other services are doing with recruiting now? We're doing good. And uh, that, is, that is just, you know, we're meeting the goals even during COVID. You know, that was one of the main questions that we had. So are we going to be able to get enough recruits, even with the restrictions in all of our basic military training installations, to be able to meet the desired end state? And it took us about two to three months to be able to go ahead and get to a good course of action to where we knew exactly what risk we could assume to be able to go ahead and continue with recruit training in order to meet that goal. But every single one of the services has come back that they're going to be pretty close to it, to the goals for the year. So, again, recruiting and uh, accessions has been good for us, even during COVID. Absolutely. And I could imagine the challenges that uh, our recruiters out there across all the services are facing in a COVID environment have to shift gears on how they do it. I mean, we've always said that this is a people to people business um, and there's a lo lot of limitations that COVID have put on us, but you say that numbers are looking good and retention is strong. Yeah, and a lot of that was uh, the Department of Defense itself uh, came up with criteria during the, the restrictions for travel that recruiters were one of those uh, exemptions because we, kn we knew that we needed to continue to feed the machine in order to meet the end strip. And now we also, that was calculated by the demographics and what we know about COVID, that the younger population was healthier. So we were able to assume a little bit more risk in there. Then the services came back and they developed plans on how to conduct this mass training with the minimal impact of infection, which they have. And if you go to Great Lakes, Lackland, any, any of our basic military, uh, uh, Paris Island, any of our uh, basic military institutions, training institutions, you will see how phenomenal they have done in mitigating the risk of, of transmission. Yeah, that's excellent work by the entire team. Yeah. Really, and it's an example of how the entire Department of Defense will overcome and adapt based on any situation. Absolutely. Our mission doesn't stop, does it? Sir? No, no. It doesn't stop. There's no breaks for 
for the folks in and the, the enemy gets a vote too. <laughs> That's right. Well, see, going out to another question from Troy. Mm -hmm. Siak, regarding fitness, the Army recently changed their Army physical fitness test to the Army combat fitness test. And this is big talk in the Army right now. Um, whenever you change, make a change, it always is. But the new test focuses on activities that soldiers would do during combat. Are the other services looking at changing any of their programs as well? Yeah, well, th the guy responsible for the Army combat fitness test is... Uh... <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know who that guy is. But... <laughs> no, but uh, so to, to some extent, uh, and I can use my own service as an example to where we always had a different uh, physical fitness test for special tactics, meaning the special operations component of the United States Air Force. So there was a different criteria and that was combat based. And now the Air Force is looking at other specialties like, uh, you know, security policemen, firemen. Uh, they're looking at uh, combat weather as an example, some of the other uh, specialties to be able to go ahead and create a more realistic test that will actually gauge their effectiveness in combat. So some services are adapting that. And I, I'm personally glad that the Army ended up going to that particular model because our training up to this point was linear. And I mean, nobody cares how fast we can run uh, a mile and a half, two miles, three miles. I mean, you don't run away from the enemy. You actually go ahead and engage combat. You know, so how about we make you strong enough and more confident in your abilities to be able to do that? Absolutely. And I'll tell you, just uh, the, the brilliance put behind the ACFT, as you mentioned earlier, the people that worked on that so hard. You know, we worked with the other services to help create yes. that, to find um, the positive things that each of the services were doing. And each one of the services is doing some phenomenal things in the, in the area of total fitness and, and yes. health and fitness. Going to another topic, it's very important, um, especially in the Army right now, it's a hot topic, is talent management, SEAC. Mm -hmm. How do we manage talent um, to select the best possible candidates for joint billets across the force? So the talent management for joint billets is actually very thorough and deliberate. You know, we accept the nominations from the service senior enlisted advisors, which basically they filter through the best of the base. And they're looking at experience to see who has had exposure to the joint environment before, whether it's via deployment, education, actual assignment uh, throughout their careers, embassy duties, and so on. Then we go ahead and filter through those applications to see who the best fit is for the qualifications that the hiring authority, I mean that general officer is looking for. Then after that, we provide the best candidates, those slates provided by the services to the hiring authority with a month time to be able to go ahead and uh, look at every single candidate and then conduct the interviews. But when it comes to the service preparation for this particular initiative, we're providing feedback on how each Heron Authority felt about the slate that they received, the slate meaning the candidates that were interviewed and where the, short, the shortcomings were gauged when it came to their particular interaction with that leader. The other thing that I'm doing right now as the SEAC is that I'm talking to the Heron Authority before and after to just go get a fresh perspective on how they felt the slating process would, went. Did they feel that they have strong candidates, weak candidates? What would they wish to have seen in those packages that came forward? And then we're gonna take that information and actually put it in a concept like Gateway to be able to go ahead and start arming our people earlier on to better understand what the joint machine is suspected, uh, expecting of them. Well, see, thanks for sharing that. Out to one of our industry partners, Dennis M says, how can industry help with brain health? What are some solutions that you're looking for from industry to help with your cause, to, to help fight this illness and injury? Well, and this is, uh, the issue of brain health is not something that we're getting after alone, alone as a department. There's already a lot of data and a lot of studies out there from industry that have been provided to us and Special Operations Command specifically, you know, they're, they're kind of like the lead in this particular initiative. So there's a lot that the that industry has done, but we're looking now into the future to see what we can do to be uh, a better sensor of the issue itself. And how are we gonna be able to identify, like I mentioned, I with sensors and things of that nature that can predict the body's exposure much like we do to radioactive uh, uh, energy and uh, other things. How, how can we better predict how somebody's had too much in order for us to have them take an E and get better? Yeah, well, thanks, yeah. Uh Another question for Frank Y. Siak, with the COVID pandemic so prevalent across the U.S., it has greatly affected the employment picture for National Guard and Reserve members who find their civilian jobs may have been lost or, or even hours significantly reduced. 
How important is it the personal finance readiness of the force? And what's the status of it now, in your opinion? Yeah, so the total finance readiness is part of the total force fitness initiative. In fact, there's eight criteria that we're looking at, and financial being one of them. And it is very important for us to continue to tackle not only what affects the member, but their families. And I know that there's a lot of uh, soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, Coast Guardsmen, and space professionals that lost a salary in the middle of COVID. You know, their spouse may not be working at the time, and they were depending on those uh, funds. So again, we ended up uh, creating mechanisms to be able to alleviate a lot of that stress. But going into the future, we talked about certification, something that you were big on. You know, what is it that is going to make our people, you know, a living relevant to their duties and also to their families? So spouse licensures, uh, some exposure to industry are things that we're looking at to make sure that our spouses have better opportunities for employment uh, in the United States and abroad. And then just uh, ramping up the way that we're going to go ahead and advise our people when it comes to financial uh, responsibility. So those are things that we're doing to ensure that our members are financially ready to be able to execute the mission. Because there's nothing that is more worrisome than knowing that you're not going to make ends meet or having to worry about your family because you're not able to provide for them. So it's very important for us. Absolutely. And see, I just have to comment on the fact that when you were going through the services, you said soldiers, sailors, airmen, marine, coast guardmen, and space professionals, because we do have a new force now, don't we? That is, that is correct. Yeah. We we don't have a name for them just yet, but space professionals, professionals uh, yeah. sounds good. That sounds good. Yeah. Well, excellent. See, yeah. Another question from our audience. Uh, do you have any advice for junior troops for career progression? Um, let's say, you know, E3s and E4s out there across the force. The best advice that I can give every single one of you, regardless of service, is just to be a sensor. Be on active receive mode. Listen to what people are saying whether it's negative or positive. Listen to what your leaders are telling you, the reasons they make you to do things. I believe we call it embracing the suck sometimes because not everything is pleasant when it, when it comes to, uh, to military service and our duties that we have to carry. But just be listening, be learning you know, as, as you navigate the waters of, uh, of your career. What you're gonna get to find is that you know, you're, gonna, you're gonna start getting a lot of experience just by listening to what people are doing and what people are saying. And you're going to be able to tailor your method and start developing your way ahead on how you're going to properly lead your troops, because eventually you will become a supervisor. And there's nothing more powerful than somebody with the experience and the cognitive ability to just know exactly, hey, this particular situation made me feel bad. This particular situation helped me be better than what I, than what I was. And be able to relate your story to uh, people based on the on what you learn every day by listening. Absolutely. Another question from our audience, SEAC. There's always a new recommended training course that referring to the education discussion we had previously um, that the troops are encouraged to complete. How do we prioritize PME and education with what's actually most relevant for our jobs? Well, I believe that time in your career is the most relevant aspect. What is it that we need you to do? For example, Basic military training, we need, to, we need for you to learn what your service is all about and what is required of you. Once you become a technician and you get your MOS, then we need you to be the best X that the Army, Air Force, Marine Corps, Navy, Coast Guard, and Space Force is paying you to do. And then after that, it is all about now that you are you know, well ingrained in the culture of your service, you know your specialty, how good of a leader you're gonna be. So it's a sequential approach to the way that we teach you things. But uh, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't blur the lines at some point when it comes to becoming better at what you do while learning something else. But again, I think the, time, the timeliness of any particular topic is critical to the way that we'll develop our, jump, our, our young people. Absolutely, and continuing the discussion on education, Michael G says the Joint Chiefs recently published guidance about educating officers for tomorrow's way of war. Do you plan to publish an enlisted version of that same document? Absolutely. And remember the, the five uh, 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 attributes that we, just, uh, that we just provided, that is part of that initiative. Because after the chairman published that, we're going to provide a similar document signed by all the senior enlisted advisors of the services on what we require from each enlisted member as a joint member uh, when it comes to, uh, to joint education. So yes, we are doing the same. Excellent. 
And uh, back on discussion of the, the space professionals, is, will there be a senior enlisted advisor of the Space Force when it's finally complete? Well, we have one, and that is uh, Chief Master Sergeant Roger Toberman. And he was actually sworn in here, here recently, but uh, he was the second member of the Space Force, you know, following the, <laughs> the chief of staff. But, uh, and right now they're slowly building up what the, what the culture is going to be, what the required attributes are going to be. They're going to be uh, basically taking over um, specialties from the other services to be able to go ahead and start building the Space Force. But we do have them, and he's probably going to be the busiest senior enlisted advisor here over the next couple of years because he's creating something from scratch. Yeah, absolutely. I can imagine having the task of, hey, build a, uh, a service in the Department of Defense. It's been a long time. It's, since a, it's, all, it's a tough job just maintaining one, let alone building one. That's right. <laughs> Back out to our audience, Siak, for a few more questions. Many of us have never seen combat. Um, and how do we become more comfortable addressing stress and depression from a non-combat role? Well, the first thing that I will tell you is that, you know, never, never measure your worth by your proximity to the fight. And I heard that a long, long time ago. And it takes a big machine to make everything work. And I will tell you that, you know, from personal experience, I was involved in a mission to where there were about seven different AFSCs that were involved in making the mission a success. Anywhere from the cooks to the cops, to the logisticians, to the maintainers, pilots, air crew, special operators that made this, this very complex mission work. At the end of that mission, once it was a success, the key leader for that mission, a joint leader, a Navy leader, actually said that the actions of the Air Force were decisive in making this particular mission be a success in less than 72 hours. So again, you know, regardless of where you work and regardless where you are, military service is stressful. It doesn't have to have combat behind it. I mean, life is stressful. And then the demands that we place upon you, you know, when it comes to deploying, because deployments don't have, you know, a combat AFSC or MOS behind it. We need those logisticians. We need those other people to be able to go ahead and sustain the mission. And you're going to be away from your families. So again, we place no difference when it comes to combat and garrison stress because they're both going to degrade your effectiveness equally if you do have it. So, now, Staying on the topic of mental health and resilience, uh, one of our listeners out there wants to know, do you have any book recommendations for leadership and resilience? Oh, my favorite book is, is by Dr. Wes Roberts, and that is The Leadership Secrets of Attila the Hun. And that book was given to me years and years ago. I was an E4 graduating Ehrman Leadership School when Brigadier General Lake provided me a copy of the book saying, hey, this is the reason why I do things the way that I do. And it, it is a good, uh, a good narrative to go ahead and carry on for the rest of your career. I still read it. I still pass it out to, uh, to people as, as a gift because there's a lot of good lessons in there. But if I had to recommend one book, that will be it. That'd be excellent. Mm -hmm. Andrew H. asks, Siak, as the senior enlisted NCO of all the services, can you share with us what you got, you, what got you where you are today and why you were selected to be the SEAC um, over many other highly qualified candidates out there? I believe it's a combination of uh, credibility, humility, and experience. Um, when I interviewed with, uh, with Chairman Milley, um, the interview was about 25 minutes long. And the chairman was running late, obviously, because of all of the stuff that happens at the Pentagon. And by the time we sat down to talk, it was a very, very personal conversation about different things. He wanted to know about my deployment history. He wanted to know about my assignments. He wanted to know about my family. He wanted to know about stressful situations and how I dealt with them. He wanted to know about my education. So he was taking a whole person approach to the way that he conducted the interviews. But what I didn't get to see was all of the homework that he ended up doing on the side when it comes to reviewing the records and what has been said about you throughout your career. So the actions that you take today, the relationships that you make today, and the impact that you make today that is going to last years and years uh, beyond you is actually going to decide where you're going to be placed next. Never bid for an assignment. Never bid for a position. Instead, let's just let your actions take you where you need to be. Let them place you in the place that is best suited for your actions, your talent, and your abilities. Siak, well said. And it's obviously the reason why you are our senior listed advisor. Siak, thank you. Um, you know, here's one, Siak, from the audience that you hear all the time. And uh, I know that our, many of our listeners out there would like to hear 
uh, your response. Are there any plans or discussions about bridging the enlisted officer pay gap? Well, I mentioned earlier the quadrennial review for military compensation. And, uh, you know, we realize that the force is, is getting more and more educated by the day. You know, when you look at the, the data of bachelor's degrees, as an example, within the enlisted force, I mean, uh, almost everybody's got one right now. Even a lot of young men and women coming into a basic training, they already have, you know, bachelor's, even master's. Um, when it comes to the pay gap, you know, we need to make sure that we actually compensate the duties that are being performed. And I know that I have even seen on social media, uh, and, and this is just kind of like a tongue in cheek um, comment that somebody made. It's like, hey, you know, the last time I was in a convoy, I saw very few officers and a lot of enlisted. It's like, well, you know, we have to realize that we're being compensated by what we were paid to do. And those were the expectations of us as professional war fighters. Now, when it comes to the responsibility that comes along with certain duties, yeah, we need to continue to keep looking to see how are we gonna best compensate our force to be able to not only keep pace with the industry, but also to ensure that we keep our people motivated to stay in and stay with us for the long run. But again, it's something that we never take our eyes off of it and we'll continue to make sure to advocate for you. Absolutely, Jack, and, and our mission is to provide adequate, adequate compensation for uh, to maintain a healthy force across the, all the Department of Defense. I know that you <laughs> yeah, guys are working. yeah I, <laughs> and I, I never thought that by joining the service that I would call myself rich. So, uh, <laughs> but I, I certainly love my purpose and I love, it, love everything that I do. That's why I'm here close to 30 years now. Well, thanks for the work that you're doing. Yeah. Take care of our service members. Siak, so, yeah, a few more questions before we have to go, but uh, you mentioned the quadrennial review, and this is from Mark H., Mm -hmm. of military compensation as a discussion topic with the military senior enlisted advisors. Uh, would you please share with us what considerations are being given to help make sure military families living in high cost areas are able to make ends meet and keep food on the table for their family? Is there any work being done in that area? Well, so yeah, there's work that has been done from years before, i.e. COLA and other things, the cost of living allowances and things of that nature. And this is a topic that we're always discussing just to make sure that we're keeping track of inflation and cost of living. Uh, uh, PNR from the Department of Defense, you know, is consistently looking at it. And we, we're always discussing what is it that we need to do. We need to go ahead and put a little bit more here. Uh, SNAP is another one, the supplemental nutrition uh, pay, uh, just to make sure that families are able to go ahead and put food on the table. So there's uh, a myriad of mechanisms and a, myri a myriad of, uh, of actions that we take every year just to ensure that our service members are taken care of. Absolutely. And uh, Michael G, you want to know back on our conversation of your recommendation for a professional reading. Have you published a professional reading list yet? I have. And uh, I, I actually pushed the first one last year or no, earlier this year. And I'm getting ready to do a second version of that. Now, I will caution you that I'm not publishing on those lists the national bestsellers of the time. If you get to look at some of these books, they're over 20 years old. And the reason I publish those books in my particular reading list is because number one, they're relevant to what we're doing today. Number two, that they, they, they have stood the test of time. They weren't just a flavor of the month. And number three, because I read them, I, I go back to them. I look at my notes and my highlights just because there's always something good in there to learn from it. So when I publish something out, uh, my apologies if you cannot find it right away on, on Amazon, but uh, we'll make sure that uh, we do our best to, uh, identify the links where you can get those books if they're kind of like out of print or something uh, of that nature. Well, thanks, Siak. And I know we're getting a lot of questions from our audience out there, and we only have a few more minutes, and we'll probably get through one or, more, one or two more questions. Uh, Raymond E. Siak says, have we reached a point in history where senior NCOs must have a four-year or better degree uh, to continue upward? Well, no. I don't believe so. It's not a requirement for enlisted service. And uh, it's good on you because, again, it aids with that uh, cognitive intelligence that we were talking about. It also builds your credibility, but it's not a requirement. You know, I made it all the way to United States Africa Command without a bachelor's degree. And then I was kicking myself in the head for not accomplishing my education earlier because I felt like I could have done so much better if I would have done it. But it was never a requirement for me. There was never pressure for me to get a bachelor's degree in order to make it to certain things. But once you get that education, trust me, it's almost like getting tattoos. You just keep wanting to get more <laughs> and more and more because it just becomes something that, uh, that actually becomes a part of you. Excellent. Well, Siak, we'll close it out with one more question because I know that your time is very valuable. And we appreciate the time you've given AUSA today 
and our listeners. Um, what is your personal routine for being mentally fit and what's the balance between personal and work life for you? So my routine for staying mentally fit, obviously I got a little bit of help here recently. You know, we already talked about that, you know, but uh, my day begins at 0345 when the alarm clock goes off. I need to get at least my hour and a half to two hours of PT in the morning. That's the first thing that gets my mind going, the juices flowing. Then I like to have a little bit of time to read before the day gets started. By 0730, our battle rhythm starts with the joint staff update. And I have, as a senior enlisted advisor to the chairman, I have to provide topics or advice on the topics that are going to be discussed throughout those, uh, those forums. And then throughout the day, I'm always consulting with my staff uh, specifically to make sure that I'm not missing out on any points of view that can help better decisions to provide military advice to our senior leaders. Um, when I come home, it's my time to go ahead and shift gears and go ahead and get the home hat on and see what is it that my family needs. And uh, often, and I have to be candid about this, I've been guilty about placing more stake on the military life than the home life. You know, and sometimes you're aloof to some of the needs. So for anybody listening right now, if your family comes up to you and they ask you to do something today and they often do not ask you to do much, it's very important to them. So please just do it. It will keep you out of hot water, more of the hot water that I've been in uh, continuously by not listening. But uh, balance is a, is a tricky word. And I will tell you that uh, prioritizing is better than balance because military life is not going to go ahead and sometimes give you enough breathing room to be able to go ahead and have an equal balance of it because that's what balance is, is equality. But what you can concentrate on is just being able to uh, take an E and have a plan in place for somebody else to cover your duties while you need to go ahead and tend to something important to your families. So again, just prioritize your life effectively. And part of that is gonna come from discussion with your family members. I've been guilty of it. I'm pretty sure that you have encountered that in your uh, year, in your years in the army, but uh, I highly recommend that you go ahead and prioritize better in order to be balanced. Well, well said, Siak, and thank you. Siak, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. And listeners, thank you for sending your questions. Those questions, again, that didn't get answered by the SEAC today, we'll make sure that he gets a copy of those and he'll see those firsthand. SEAC, I'd just like to offer you any closing comments you have for our listening audience out there and for our AUSA members. No, and again, for uh, you, Dan, and the AUSA, thank you so much for having me here today. And then for everybody listening out there, uh, just know that we have uh, your well-being, your effectiveness, and your care first and foremost in our minds from the Department of Defense, and we're here for you. So please don't be silent out there, whether it's mental health, any issues, financial or anything else, please contact your senior enlisted advisors. We're here to listen. And also I'm here for you from the department head to be able to uh, make, make sure that you're taken care of. So again, it's an honor to serve with you and uh, an honor to be here with you today. Well, Siak, thank you. And we thank you for joining us today. And We'll welcome you back at any time, Siak. Uh, Thank you, Dan. Before I close, I want to inform our audience of some upcoming events. And continuing our five-part noon series on Army discussion on race on 16 September, we'll have Dr. Casey Wardinsky, Assistant Secretary of the Army for Manpower and Reserve Affairs, Department of the Army, Mr. Anselm Beach, Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Army for Equality and Inclusion, and also Lieutenant General Gary M. Brito, the Deputy Chief of Staff for Personnel, accompanied by Command Sergeant Major John F. Sampa, the United States Army National Guard, will all be here to talk about our continuing conversation of race and inclusion on the 16th of September. Tune in at noon uh, for the noon report. And join us for 13 to 16 October for the AUSA Now 2020 Annual Meeting and Exposition. Registration is open on our website. Please go to AUSA.org and register for your position at AUSA Now today. Finally, we want to thank all of our AUSA members who are out there. And membership does matter. Membership of AUSA brings great programming, just like you saw today. Please, if you know someone who'd like to be a member or you need to renew, renew your membership, go to AUSA.org to do that today. SEAC, again, we want to thank you for joining us today. And we want to thank all of our listeners for tuning in. God bless each and every one of you.